Today I'm going to embark on a journey to become the first ever random player to qualify for the European Championships. I've been practicing a lot more over the last couple of weeks and my skills have improved a lot. Not quite sure if I'm there yet, but I'm going to do my absolute best. First, we have to play in the open qualifiers. If we make it through, we're going to have a chance to make it to the main event, the European Championship, through the closed qualifiers. I'm going to be showing you guys the best game from every series I play. Wish me luck. Let's begin. The first series is going to be against Zyomech. This is the round of 64, and I need to make at least top 8 to make it to this open qualifier. There are two open qualifiers. So even if I lose in this one, we will have another shot, but obviously it's way more comfortable to make it this one. Now, my opponent Zyomech is currently a 5.6k Grandmaster Protoss. I think his peak was just above 6k. I know that he has been playing a lot of those other RTS games, like he was quite good in both Zero Space and Stormgate, I believe. So maybe, or hopefully, that's going to diminish his skills a little bit for me. Now, obviously, this is going to be a voiceover if you haven't noticed yet. The last time I played a qualifier, I think it was for the Global Finals. I just felt like if I was playing against these really high multitasking player, in particular Terrence, it would just be a disaster if I was doing commentary at the same time. Like I would miss all their attacks and I didn't want to compromise my chances. I thought it would be way cooler if I could show you guys a really good run, just play at my peak performance and then commentate it a little bit after. Now this game is really cool. Oh, I should mention, I, I almost forgot, is that the score here is 0-1. In the first game I rolled Protoss. And I tried a blink call in and it failed pretty miserably. Now, good thing for me is that I was playing on Ghost River, which is my least favorite map to play against Protoss, I believe. It's a very short map that I usually lose on, so losing that map is not necessarily the biggest deal. Now, why I think this ZVP was going to be very interesting is because I have one build that usually does the trick for me against Protoss in these tournaments. You guys have probably seen it before if you have watched my Zerg content. And that is the 1717 double link drop into Hydras. Now, I've been kind of worried that even though that build is quite good, is that people would see it coming now and they would start blind countering it. I've had it blind countered once. Like, literally, I think I played against Four Jumi and he literally sent the Stalker to my Overlord drop spot and killed my Overlord. And then the game was just Im just immediately over. Like, I don't mean just a little bit over. Like, I absolutely had no chance from there. So I wanted to switch it up a little bit. And I was going to do an experimental build. Now, I was a little worried because this build has definitely not given me as much success as the Link Drop build has. But I, I wanted to try it anyway. I've been trying it in multiple matchups in ZVP. I guess it is probably the best one. So what I'm going to do here is I went for an extra fast hatchery. I did an extractor trick and made a hatchery before the overlord, which is going to allow me to make my queens faster. And then I'm going to go for a queen drop attack. And this build, I feel like there's a lot of potential, but sometimes my Zerg skills are a little bit lacking. So I don't find the right adaptations and stuff. But hopefully this time I can do a little better. Now, notice how I split up my first two Zerglings. This is a move I really like because typically Protoss players like this, they will start looking for one of the Zerglings. Exactly. And then the other one can run in and get an absolutely free scout. Now, this is not super important because... 90% of the games that Protoss plays against Zerg is Stargate. As you can see, this is also going to be a Stargate. But sometimes they do play Twilight. And especially when, just as I mentioned before, you're not that good at adapting like me with Zerg. Playing against things that are a little off could be a bit of a problem. So I'm just really happy getting my scout off. Um, and now, yeah, I guess we're just on track. You know, I know what I want to do. I don't have to adapt any further, and that is nice. Now, notice how the first adept comes in. I already have two queens in each base, and I am making my lair already. And now I'm going to go for my third hatchery. What I like so much about this version is that when I did other versions of the queen drop cheese that I want to do, is that I usually didn't have a follow-up at all. Like, there would not be a third hatchery. But with this one, we have more queens, five instead of three, which you have with the normal build. And I also have a third hatchery, so if I do want to make drones behind it, let's say I do like a medium amount of damage. I feel like most of the time when you do this build, you want to go for like an extreme amount of damage, right? Either you do that or you do no damage. But let's say I do a medium amount of damage, then I want to have the ability to, to, to transition. Now his oracle is actually going to get trapped here because I have so many freaking queens. And he's going to lose that first oracle. He's probably trying to find the perfect spot for Rico. But sadly for him, queens do have a lot of range. And now here we go. I made five queens, started the lair on my main hatchery. And then I started overlord speed on the second hatchery. So I'm going to be able to bring over my queens very, very fast. I'm going to make spores anyway, just because I'm a little bit afraid of an oracle coming in later. As you can see, he does have another one. Protoss players typically make three. Three oracles is usually like the max 
magic number. Now, I did send my other queens a little bit late here. So this is going to arrive a couple seconds later than it normally would. But that shouldn't be the biggest deal. So far, this game has been going quite well for me. That was, I think, my first mistake of the game. But besides that, I killed an Oracle and I killed an Adept. And I got the perfect scout early on. And I even delayed his Adept early on. Now here, I saw that this Starker was barely a little bit out of position. So this is a perfect moment for me. It's going to allow me to run into the main. This doesn't look like the biggest deal ever because he has enough oracles to deal with it. But keep in mind, I'm going to be attacking the front with my queens at the same time. So how is he going to be able to defend both? That's going to be very, very tough for him. Now, this is not really all I want to do. I've had a couple of games where I managed to deny the third base, but then I still don't really manage to uh, win the game from there. Like, let's say they make a bunch of blink stalkers and they can defend their natural, and that's where it gets very tough. But this is something I really like doing. You guys know I'm not that great at creep spreading, but I do really like spreading creep in front of my opponent's base. It just gives me like an instant heads up whenever my opponent moves out, and that is really, really nice. Now, this is the nicest thing about the Queen is that it is insanely good against Void Rays, which is a unit that Protoss players could make very early on. And also, quite frequently, they do like to make it to be safe. But Queens are incredibly good against those, especially look at the energy. Look at those purple bars. These Queens have so many transfuses. These are not going to fall to a Void Ray anytime soon. Now, he's doing a really good job with the Oracles here. He's going to hold position them over there so they don't get baited into the Queens and they just make sure that the links don't go further. So I need to micro my Queens a little forward. Back at home, I already started my Roach Warm. So I have a transition just in case. Like I said, I've had it a couple times before where they managed to defend with just a couple Stalkers and they can counterattack and I only have links. So I just want to make sure that I get Roach Warren and Roach Speed up and that's going to definitely help me in that transition. I'm already making drones too. And I feel like this game really shows the strength of this build. Like I'm doing so much damage, but behind it, I think I'm probably at almost 45 drones already, which is pretty crazy. Like I have more drones than he could mine with, even if his natural was fully saturated. But this is what his natural natural looks like right like there's links and queens there's even creep maybe he can't even take the natural suit anymore because there's gonna be too much creep out there and i didn't even make that many units anymore the reason why i like this kind of attacks with queens or i should say why i like the idea of attacking with queens is because queens often don't really have that good of an answer early on. The answer typically is make more units and have a lot of shield batteries. But queens don't have a hard counter early on. There's not going to be, um, let's say, zealots with charge. I guess stalkers with blink would be okay. And then a real hard counter would be like disruptors. Those are all things they're not going to have. They'll typically have like void rays, oracles, adepts. And none of those are that good against queens. So these units can be extremely oppressive. At this point, I already have, I think, three gases and 50 drones he's gonna use his oracle to deny a little bit of my mining but realistically he needs to do way more than that he has to take this natural pretty soon also just like i've mentioned before i don't know why i do this but my creep spread is always so much better on the other side of the map like why am i actually spreading creep here instead of you know that i feel like i haven't spread a creep uh, trooper from my own base in ages i've had one creep trooper going down the middle and if you look at my opponent's base there's like freaking 30 creep troopers so the oracles are gonna come back i think I think I saw a bunch of zealots there walking down the natural, which normally would be very scary against Link Queen. The zealots are very good, especially if they get charged, but this is why we got the Roach Warren, guys. I have Roaches, which are an extremely good counter against zealots in good enough numbers. I'm using these links to body block him so the zealots can't get away, and it looks like we're just gonna crush him and bring the score to 1-1. Game 3 was about as smooth as Game 2. I rolled Terran, and after tearing him apart with a lot of early harassment, typical Euthermal style, starting off with Reapers, then going into a Cyclone drop, and then into some auto turret Raven harass, I killed him with my first push, securing best of 3, and moving on to the round of 32. The second series is going to be against Zane, a 5.9k Grandmaster Protoss. We are currently in the round of 32 which means we are two series wins away from making it to the closed qualifier. Now, I rolled Terran here. Uh, I do think I got a little bit fortunate rolling Terran a decent amount of times, to be honest. I was kind of worried that I would only have to play PvP. You know, for, for a long time, I was considering practicing my Protoss specifically to play Protoss in these qualifiers, not necessarily do it with random, but just with another race. That thought it'd be fun. But the thing is, these qualifiers are absolutely stacked with Protoss players. Like, more than 50% of the qualified players are always going to be Protoss. And I didn't want to be playing PvP only, so I'm glad that I actually got a decent amount of Terra and I got Zerg in the last series, so I don't have to play only PvP. That is nice. Now, I've been really enjoying going for Proxy Reaper. Proxy Reaper is also the opening I did against Zyomech in the first series, but I wanted to make sure to switch it up a little bit. A reason why I like Proxy Reaper a lot as random is because a lot of times against Terran, 
what Protoss players will do is before scouting your base, they will just scout around their own base quickly. But if you're playing against random, the only time you would ever do that um, is if you have been proxied before, I think. Because think about it this way, right? Like Terrence proxying, I don't know what the average chance of that is, maybe like 20% or 10% or something, right? And then you also have to calculate the fact that he doesn't know my race, so I could also be Protoss or Zerg. So scouting for a proxy is really a long shot here, right? So most people aren't going to do that, but I still want to make sure that people didn't start blind countering my Terran strategies because realistically, it is not that much extra time to just quickly check one of the proxy locations. So that's why I'm going to go for a double gas here. Now, one thing that's a bit weird about my Terran is that Terran realistically is my best race. But since I retired from pro play, it had also been my least played race. I've enjoyed way more trying to figure out the other races and making some really stupid cheeses with the other races and stuff like that. So I actually don't really have a lot of Terran builds. I know that sounds crazy because my main race is Terran. But when I think about realistic TVP builds, I only pretty much have two. And this one... It's kind of generic. I gave it my own twist, so that's gonna that's what's gonna make it a lot better. But it's kind of generic. I really just started by playing ladder, and I was playing. Okay, so Terrence play a little double gas. I'm gonna play double gas. Make a medium amount of Reaper Heliot. Make a Starper. Like it was all very generic. So I kind of started with that frame, and then I gave it my own twist. A lot of time I like going for banshees. A lot of time I like going for like tank pushes or something. And here we scout that our opponent's going for a Robo. Now this was very uncommon until recently uh, i think it was classic in the gsl that made this a little more popular opening with robo first i always kind of thought that robo was a bit underrated robo the reason why people don't like it is because you don't have the mobile anti-harassment defense terrans really like attacking with anything like if you've ever played you know ladder against terran you know that they have like 500 bills to attack you with they can go for widow mine drops hellion drops liberators reapers or like a three racks it's just anything right and Robo is the only tech that doesn't have that mobile anti-harassment. Like, they don't have either Blink or Phoenixes. Now, my opponent sent both Adepts across the map, which means that this Hellion now has free reign. And if you look at that gateway right there, guys, that gateway is actually not producing. I think my opponent here was a little greedy because he killed my Scouting Reaper. And now this Hellion, this, this is like the most valuable Hellion of all time. I did, I'm not just going to get all the probes. I also see that he's making a Stargate, which confirms to me that he is playing the classic build where he is going going for a robo into stargate this looks very strange if you haven't watched starcraft 2 recently or esports at least this is going to look super super strange to you like robo into stargate is opposite of how people would normally execute this build normally you would go for the stargate get phoenixes out and then go for the robo for colossus but protoss players have been switching it up a little bit and i personally think it's a really cool strategy so the reasoning behind this is that the phoenixes they kind of come as a surprise if you see the robo you can go for that harassment that i was talking about before so let's say you see the robo you know there's no blink no phoenixes you go for the widow mine drop you show up with the medevac there are suddenly two phoenixes out your medevac can't escape and you're behind so i actually think it's a very cool strategy but here he was just a little bit too greedy by sending out both of these adepts leaving his base completely open now admittedly i don't think he could have realistically expected me to have like a freaking hellion running by but i guess that's just the thermal effect there's always some random units in some random places where they aren't supposed to be and thus you have to play a little bit safer <laughs> to be honest i know from my experience playing protoss against terran that Terrans always do stupid stuff. Like, it's not just necessarily about the harassment, but Terrans really like attacking and harassing and setting their stuff here and there. Like, when I play PvT, I even make a blind battery at the front. Like, I don't even try to scout for anything too dangerous. If I see I'm playing against a Terran and I don't have literal perfect scouting, which is pretty unrealistic, I'm going to make a blind battery because I know my Terrans do a lot of crazy things. And most of the time, it pays off. They're always going to try to attack you with, like, a Cyclone or whatever, you know? Here you can see he also has a battery you probably realized like oh yeah i know your thermals are random but let's let's remember he is a terran player at heart so i should start probably keep preparing for like stupid stuff over here now his army is better than mine immortals if you've never seen immortals fight against cyclones i'm i'm happy for you you don't want to see it like immortals are so good against cyclones it might be like one of the most absolute one-sided fights in the game like you you have to run for your life cyclones can absolutely not do anything against immortals they almost get two shot like it's crazy now, this is a pretty crazy move, of course, but I know that his main army was immortal, so they 
can't shoot up, right? He only has two Phoenixes. So I'm just harassing him a bit with my Vikings, getting some free scouting. Want to make sure I don't stick around for too long, because if I do, um, that means that the Phoenix count is going to catch up and be able to kill my Vikings. Gonna kill an observer. I actually noticed when I was uh, re-watching this, now I'm doing commentary, that I saw the observer earlier. When he was killing my army with his immortals, I saw the observer fly there and I had an opportunity to kill that, but sadly I didn't see it in the game itself when I was playing it. But I killed it now, so that's fine. And realistically, I wasn't hiding anything, right? Like, I'm playing three racks with bio follow-up. I know the start was a little bit strange, where I was pressuring in with Cyclones and Vikings after running by the freaking Hellion. But right now, I don't really have anything to hide in particular. He should know that I'm just doing what I'm doing, going for three racks, making some factory units. I guess that is the biggest thing he can scout, whether I'm making Widow Mines or Siege Tanks. That's always going to be nice to know. So he did kill a couple of my SCVs, but I do think with my double engineering bay already being online, as well as the third command center, I'm going to find myself in a pretty decent spot. I know that Immortals make for a very strong army, but the thing is they do also cost a lot. I think they cost 275 minerals now. So he spent a lot of money making three Immortals. Maybe he even made a fourth at this. But yeah, he does have four Immortals already. There's more than a thousand minerals. That's 1100 minerals right there in Immortals. So... You know, that's 11, uh, not 11 gates, I was going to say gateways. That's like 11 zealots, for example, right? So let's say he made two immortals less. He could have had the nexus a little bit earlier. He could have had a forge making upgrades and his army is going to be better later on. But since he spent it on so early, I think his supply count is probably going to be quite low. If I would let him max out with an army like this that's gonna be like pure immortal here i was super surprised i didn't actually kill a phoenix by the way like isn't that crazy i really thought the marines would have just dropped and killed the phoenix there but yeah but i was gonna say if i let him max out on like pure immortal phoenix colossus maybe even like carries at some point his army's gonna be freaking insane so i'm gonna take the opportunity to pressure it was really good by him to find those two medevacs because those two medevacs i think probably could have ended the game like his army is very slow so if he's gonna have to chase a big drop in his main base with like immortals that's not gonna be very pleasant for him at all and that's also why i'm stimming in so harshly he does have charge but the bulk of his army is always going to be those slow immortals notice how i already killed all of the zealots before i got to the fight the disruptor already fired apparently at a small squad on the bottom the zealots died so fast that now i can get on top of the immortals and that is going to be it 1-0 is the score the second game was very similar to the last game of the last series. I went for my famous proxy reaper build and it only took me about four and a half minutes to kill him with my cyclone drop follow up and just like that I won 2-0 and advanced to the final match of the day. The third series is going to be against Babas, a 5.6k Grandmaster Protoss and this is the qualifying match to the closed qualifier. So if I win this one that doesn't mean I'm going to qualify for the main event, but I will qualify for the next stage. If I lose this one, I'll have to come back tomorrow and play open qualifier number two. Now, I did warn you guys that there was a lot of Protoss player in the qualifiers because this is the third Protoss player in a row. They're also all like freaking demons at like 5.5 five to 6k LR. Like there are so many of them. So this is game number two. I won the first game with Terran in about four minutes. It was another one of those cheesy games. Those cheesy Terran games really paying off so far, huh? But this time I rolled Protoss. And this was actually a complete experiment. If you're wondering why the hell I'm building my gateways there, uh, this I didn't have like a particular plan. This was actually just like completely on the fly. I just figured it would be pretty cool uh, to try and mind game my opponent by just building my gateways in my natural like that's that's literally about it like i didn't have like a specific follow-up or anything i just wanted to make him go crazy the first game i cheesed him with terran now i kind of wanted to make him think that i was gonna do the same with protoss i after this game i did learn that this probably doesn't work as long as you're doing a decent build um, he's actually gonna scout the gates over here and I'm pretty sure the reason why he actually checked, it makes a lot of sense. Like, you guys might wonder, like, oh my god, this guy's a genius. Why didn't he get scared? I First of all, I chrono boosted my Nexus making probes, and I took both gases. Like, the only proxies that really are a thing in PvP are when you go for, like, a two-gate forge or try to punish a one-gate low-ground expander. Uh, but, I, yeah, it's just not very realistic if you're actually chrono boosting your nexus and taking both your gases, right? So it makes complete sense. Also, that probe is doing a crazy amount. Of, you guys saw it? That, that probe is almost half health. I even started kind of worrying a little bit here, like, oh my god, probes do a lot of damage. Now, he went for a two-gate response, so I'm not quite sure if he did that because I'm Protoss or if he was actually scared for a little bit, so he added the second gate, but either way, I think it's fine. This is a little worrisome. The reason why you always build your gateways in a wall in a PvP 
is because otherwise the devs can just shade in and one tap workers. And if you lose four workers, that's already pretty painful, right? So that's why you don't usually want to do this. So that is something I will have to deal with. Now, what's nice for me here is that he's so focused on dealing damage to that pylon that he hasn't sent his probe into the main base so I could make my Twilight Council faster than normal. Now, here, I was actually a little unfortunate because I was sure I got the mind games correct, but he did still scout me, but that was the idea. I was like, okay, he spent so much time uh, attacking the pylon, I can make my Twilight Council earlier, and then he doesn't want to lose the probe for free, so he's going to go back. Sadly for me, that didn't quite work out, and he still got a scout off, but I thought it was a pretty cool idea, and I got the probe in the end anyway now i'm gonna start blink instantly when you do this kind of build you want to chrono boost blink non-stop now this build was a little bit questionable this is actually very similar to the build if you guys remember when i showed you the game against Ziomech in round one this is pretty much the build that i lost with um in the first series like i went for like a three gate blink all in and i wasn't able to defeat him so this is a little risky but something i really like about playing with blink stalkers is that it kind of activates the micro right like i feel like if i play with mass blink stalkers i can actually outplay and micro my way out of situations so that's why i still like playing them i honestly i'm not convinced this is the best way to go like if i would have to play a best of one pvp do the best build i know i really don't think that this is the build i would go for to be honest but i do still like playing with it and at this point i was kind of in the groove i was in the third series of the day i won the last game i've been cheesy as hell so i just felt like going for it anyway now i didn't expect these four stalkers on the map so he is going to do a lot of damage i think at this point he realizes that i was going for an attack because that fight fight looked favored for him four stalkers against four when one was already red but he backed off so i think he must have realized that there were more stalkers being warped in somewhere or maybe there was an oracle coming or anything right but he definitely realized now what is good for me is this is actually an effect of playing random is that his wall is super awkward i don't think he re really realized that he wanted to make a wall because he wasn't sure what race i was so his wall ends up being super awkward like this wall is really good for me like he can't even maneuver his way through i made a sentry so i can get like a really good force field going sadly for me that force field was not the best i think i probably could have trapped a couple or more stalkers here now i was considering going for the blink forward like my blink is finished but i felt like i didn't want to risk it like i didn't know if there was like an immortal on the high ground with a sentry or something like if i blink forward and he force fields me out together with an immortal then i just lose four stalkers and that's going to be it but for now i mean we're just killing all of the pylons the batteries are the power he doesn't have gateways anymore so that just looks like it's going to be it and that is game number two done Sadly for Bubba's, this was my easiest series of the day. After winning game one in four minutes, game two in five minutes, I ended up winning game three in six minutes after some nice banshee play with a tank push. And that means I qualified for the closed qualifier as the only random player. But this is where it's really going to get tricky. All right, welcome everyone to the closed qualifier. This is where everything has to happen. Our first opponent is going to be Night Phoenix, who is by far the best opponent we have played against so far. I believe he is 6.1 to 6.2k MMR, uh, and he is a Protoss player. Now, at this point, the score was already 0-1. The first game of the series was pretty much the opposite of the first game of the open qualifier. Well, I lost both, but in the open qualifier, I was the one doing the blinkle, and then I failed in this game. He did the blinkle in against my Protoss, and he succeeded. So that was a tough first PvP. So far, I think... No, we did win one game with Protoss, right? Yeah, we won one game with Protoss against Bubbles. We lost one against Zio Max, so we are 1-2. Which is, I mean, I guess it's all right. As long as I win a couple games, I'm happy. Now, the closed qualifier works in a pretty simple way if you win two series you advance to the main event and that would be massive that would mean that we are the first random player ever to qualify for the eu regionals the european championship and if we lose twice we get eliminated now this qualifier exists out of 16 players that qualified from the open qualifier and the bottom 16 of the last European Championship. And that is exactly what makes this really difficult as an open qualifier player. Because the way the seeding works means that you're always going to play against someone who played in the last season. So you are going to be playing as the best players of, uh, you know, the entire close qualifier right away. And that's what makes it tough. Now, I was pretty happy to draw a Protoss bracket. Now, I mentioned before that there are, you know, an excess of Protoss players in this tournament. Like, there are just way too many Protoss players. So it's, you know, it's pretty logical that I get mostly Protoss players. But 
I did feel like with random, random is probably the best against Protoss. And personally, I'm the worst against Zerg. Like, Hate Me was a potential opponent for me. It's about a 6k Zerg player. And I really would not have been confident going up against him. Like, that would have been devastating. So for me, drawing a Protoss player in the first and at least in the second round, because my entire bracket was Protoss, that made me pretty happy. Now, if you guys don't know much about Night Phoenix, he is a bit of a cheesy player. Not, not necessarily in the way that he only does all-ins. He does like to all-in. But he does have kind of different styles in macro games and stuff as well. Kind of like me, you could say. So instead of being the kind of guy that would go for like a normal blink robo opening as is the standard, he would be more the kind of guy to maybe go for like an immortal timing attack or multiple stargates. Kind of like that, right? So it is a little bit hard to predict. And you could see it instantly here with him building a gateway in my main base to deal with the proxy reaper now this is not a super uncommon strategy like i've seen it before it's a pretty decent strategy and that's why i pulled sevs to kill the pylon because i think that is the best way to defend it now i'm pretty sure the probe is still alive i don't think i killed it but the gateway is on power then he's not going to be able to get the probe back inside at least for a while it would be an extremely cool strategy if he Ma uh, makes a warp prism and uses the power field to enable the warp gate. Like, that would actually be a gold tier play. Now, for now, I haven't scouted an expansion yet. I just saw the Zealot walking across the map, which is going to give my Reaper some space to deal damage in the main base, unless he has a battery. The battery is not quite finished yet, so this is going to be really nice for me. Either we're going to kill a lot of probes, or at the very least, waste all of his mining time. It is pretty hard to target the probes when they're this clumped up. I think I didn't really do the best job of microing here, to be honest. So far, I think I killed three probes which really could have been better i think i ended up killing three or four i'm not 100 sure but obviously that was a very good amount of damage and perhaps the best thing out of all is that i still keep a reaper alive so i can scout around these you can tell he's sending his units across the map instantly which really makes it feel like he doesn't have an expansion he's gonna go for a one base limb but you always want to check this is like a very typical mistake you can make is you just assume they're all inning you you stay on one base and then it turned out they made their nexus 40 seconds earlier than you expected double chrono boost and you know the rest is history they have 45 probes and you get owned right so these constant checking is very important now now at this point, I realized that he might have taken the gold base. So I'm gonna, or well, maybe it's a little bit later, I'm not sure, but I do know that I realized it at some point. So I'm gonna be checking the gold bases. At, for now, I'm convinced he's gonna go for a one base, and at some point the realization clicks. I'm like, oh crap, this map does have a couple gold bases. Yeah, exactly, that's what I'm gonna check. Um, and that's gonna be very important, because if he has a gold base, that's gonna give him so much money. Admittedly, the gold bases on this map only have one gas. So if you do play against the gold base here, there's a good chance that your opponent is still only going to be playing gateway style. Now here we find a proxy robo. I think that was an adept I saw warping in. And to me, the strategy was pretty clear here. I didn't think he was going to go for an immortal. I thought he was going to go for a warpism and drop into my base. Though this adept kind of changes my mind. I kind of thought for a second, okay, if he has an adept over there, maybe he does just want to bust it with immortals with the vision. But he does have these units in my base already. And it's scary because he does have an immortal. And immortals are obviously very good against tanks. Now I got my second tank out. He's going to see that pretty soon i'm gonna have to pull the scvs all the scvs are coming i'm gonna use my vikings to kill the warpism so he can't escape that tank did a decent amount of damage combined with the scv pool now i am gonna lose both of these vikings and then he's gonna recall that was honestly very well microed by him he made sure to target the viking and then recall out and i lost pretty much all of my units like i really don't have much left there i have a tank for marines and a medevac his army might be bigger than mine but he probably, and I'm saying probably because I didn't check the expansion again, he probably does not have an expansion. Uh, or well, he could have made it, but he probably doesn't, but I do have to recheck. But right now I'm kind of a little bit in the dark. So I'm gonna check again with the Reaper. I see the Robo is still producing. Robo units are very expensive. So he's probably still attacking, but it could also be an Observer. Observer's only costing 25 minerals, I believe. So then it wouldn't be that big of an investment. I think it actually makes sense. Like an Observer here would be pretty good, right? Because you're just gonna be able to see when your opponent's gonna move out and stuff. Doesn't cost you a lot of minerals, so he easily could have made a Nexus plus the Observer. So here I'm gonna go scout with my Reaper again. I still have the Bunker and Turret alive, and there's no expansion here yet. He could have taken the Gold, but since those rocks were still alive, I think it is unlikely that he managed to do that during the attack. So if he did, it's gonna be late. Now he's gonna try to drop on top of the tank, but there are actually more tanks there than he realized. And now that War Prism is stuck, he might have had a chance to escape if he went to the left side but now he's gonna lose the prism the immortal doesn't drop out and i think that's going to be it and the score is tied at 1-1
In game three, I got Zerg, and this was quite funny. At the start of the best of three, he begged me to play Zerg because he thought he'd win easily, but things didn't go as well for him. Despite having a rough start, I managed to outplay him with Ling drops and run bys and finished him off with a Hydra timing, sending me to a historical qualifying match. The first of potentially two qualifying matches is going to be against Petit Drogo. Now, at this point, the score is 1-1, uh, and he, you know, showed some concern about me getting Terran every single game. And then I told him this. That's actually true. Like, with Terran, I think I mentioned it earlier in the video, I actually don't have builds. I just play the same stuff. So I got Terran twice, uh, and the score is 1-1, and this time I got Zerk. Now, this is a best of five. So here I'll have to win three maps instead of just the usual two. Now, I think what my plan was here, and I actually really like this plan, is that I'm gonna go for my usual Zerg build. I think I mentioned in the first series of the day that I didn't wanna do my typical Ling drop into Hydra because it was maybe a bit more obvious. But to tell you guys a little bit more about Petit Drogo, Petit Drogo was a very high level pro gamer. He qualified for a global finals once, he won a DreamHack once, and nowadays he's retired and plays at a lower level, but he's still very good. And what I thought was that he probably doesn't pay attention as much to what builds are going going on like what the meta is and stuff so even though i feel like he's better than or well he definitely is better than the first opponent i played in this video in the open qualifier he might not necessarily be aware of this build so here sadly for me he was gonna block my expansion it's actually a downside of this map not quite sure if you guys noticed but usually you can see the probe coming with the overlord so you can hide the drone for the timing but here i can't see it because the overlord flies so fast oh so annoying for me, right? The Overlord scouts the, at the enemy's base way too fast that I wasn't able to see the probe coming, so I had to take the hatchery here. But realistically, it's not that big of a deal. Like, to be honest, this is just kind of the standard in ZVP. Now, this is something that I really like to see, is that he didn't wall on the low ground. This is a big advantage of random, is that a lot of Protoss players, they're afraid to wall on the low ground in case you get Terran or Protoss. Like, they might not necessarily be confident with that kind of expansion. So if they do it when you play Zerg, you're just going to have a bit of an advantage. Like, like against Zerg, you always want to have a quick wall off because if you don't, you're going to have to spend extra buildings to wall it off in time against Zergling attacks, especially when I'm playing a gas pool before a hatchery build like this, right? Uh, so this is always very, very pleasant to see. Once upon a time, I actually beat Showtime with my Zerg, who is, you know, an absolutely insane Protoss player, usually about 6.8k MMR, in the same situation where I went for this build, this opening, and he didn't wall off right away because it just makes it so awkward. You have to make like an extra gateway and you have to worry more about actually getting your wall off up rather than what your opponent is doing so it just makes it very annoying now notice how i have these two overlords down here this is always want to do it but what i want to do with my build i'm splitting my zerglings once again it's almost it almost kind of looks like that zerg game i played in the first series where i have like these two early zerglings that i split but this is a completely different build i'm gonna get a really fast lair and i'm gonna drop 16 links in his base and notice how he already had to put two additional buildings in his wall you can see it on the minimap which i believe we're a gateway and a stargate i'm not 100 sure but I, it would just make sense if it's a gateway and a stargate and he probably needs to add either another gateway or a battery to be safe there now as my lair is getting close to finishing i'm gonna move my overlords close to the ledge i usually prefer to keep them away from the ledge a little bit so it doesn't get scouted super fast if they do scout for it uh, but here the lair is finished and I moved them there exactly in time. It always feels really pleasant when I get my timings up perfectly. So I have two links here at the front. I see that he made another gateway, exactly what I was talking about. And he has two adepts there. Now that was a really well-timed pylon by him. Uh, he scouted my drop coming super fast, so he's probably going to be ready for this. But in my experience, there is still a lot of play you can do. So there's an Oracle. He's going to activate it right away. I lost two Zerglings. And then what you want to do is you want to periodically click the Oracle to see if it's still losing energy. I think there's also the animation, but you want to click it now and then to see that it's still losing energy. There, it ran out of energy. He used his probes to try and protect his Adepts. But since there's no third Adept and the Oracle's out of energy, I am going to be able to kill a couple probes. I didn't do that much probe damage yet, but it's been pretty good and i killed both adepts and now i'm going to be able to fly through again like oracles can't shoot up so i can just keep flying here with my overlords and it's quite nice now since i'm playing against a really good player who i know is going to use his oracle super well 
I'm just gonna make sure to make the spores. Like, I don't want to lose because I was a bit greedy and I skipped on spores. Now here, these probes are actually out of range of the battery, so I killed another four pros with those couple zerglings, and that is a really good start to this game. Normally, if I played against a Protoss that was closer to my zerg level, so like a little bit worse than Petit Drogo is, I would have been very confident here, but here I'm not confident yet, but this is honestly a very good start. Like, I can't deny that this was uh, more than enough damage. I want to guess that I probably killed eight probes. I feel like I killed four with the initial drop after the... Or yeah, exactly. Here he has three oracles. I'm so glad I made the spore. Because I would have died to this straight up probably if I didn't have the spore. So thank goodness I had that inside there. Uh, but I think I killed about eight probes. And I killed two adepts as well, which is a really good start. Lost a lot of mining time for him too. And on top of that, there's actually a couple more resources that you have to think about. Is that he wasted... Uh, his oracle energy early on like normally protos players harass a little bit faster but he had to waste the energy early on which is a pretty big deal especially against someone like me who is not uh, super perfect on the defense so he managed to kill that overlord with the stalkers but they did so much damage that i'm quite happy with them and now i can see he's taking a third base as well i was really excited to see that because on this map I feel like the third base is so hard to defend. I've died myself so many times on this map trying to defend the third base in PvP or PvT. Like, it's just really hard. Like, it's so open. And now he's going to see my Hydras for the first time. I think he did see the Hydra then earlier, but this is the first time that he sees how many Hydras I actually have. So I'm trying to spend all of my money. I have 41 drones. This is the build I've probably done the most with Zerg, so I do know exactly how to execute it. You want 41 drones, 16 on each mineral line, and 9 to saturate 3 gases. And that's way i'm gonna have enough zerglings to kind of cover for the front against let's say glaive adepts or maybe even charcels here i noticed there was a massive artosis pile on there so the pylon is gonna fall those batteries are not even finished yet but even if they did it doesn't matter i'm gonna get the oracles as well and my zerg army looks insane and at this point it's starting to look like my zerg build is even you know good enough to beat really really good protos players in this close qualifier because if i lose this one i would be quite disappointed in myself that is so many hydras out on the field he's gonna lose all of the adepts four of his gateways and his stargate are depowered and just like that we take the 2-1 lead in game four i rolled terran again and despite playing a bit nervous and not controlling my units properly my strategy was completely on point i sent my banshees to the correct base and killed so many workers i got a crazy economic lead i sniffed out his attack early enough and was able to defend both the front and the main base from the war prism at the same time my control after this started to get a little shaky as I knew I was getting close to the victory but I was decisive enough in the attacks and my micro held up and we were able to do something I really didn't think I would. Advancing through the winner bracket after beating five Protoss players in a row, we managed to become the first random player ever to qualify for the European Championships. All in all, my Zerg and Terran really held up with my Protoss being a little bit disappointing. I believe I went 1-2 with Protoss, 3-0 with Zerg, which is the most proud score for me, and 8-1 with Terran. I do consider myself a little bit lucky to draw Terran so often, but I can't take anything away from winning it an important game with Protoss and three really important games with Zerg, beating two very high MMR Protoss players to secure my spot in the main event. Thank you all for watching. See you in the European Championships.